China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi visits Seoul to set the stage for President Xi Jinping's visit to South Korea, expected later this year. Korea's number two web portal Taum and the country's top messaging application Kakao announced their merger plans on path to creating an IT company worth over three trillion won. And the Thai coup leader warns protesters to take heed, saying he's won the royal stamp of approval. Hello and welcome. I am Kang Tae in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi held talks in Seoul on this Monday. This is the Chinese diplomat's first visit to South Korea since taking office last year. The talks come amid renewed threats of a nuclear test by North Korea. Ahead of the meeting, the two officials said the talks would be an opportunity to reaffirm their strategic partnership in securing peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. The two sides also discussed details details of Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to South Korea, which is expected to take place as early as next month. Meanwhile, North Korea and Japan are holding their own talks in Sweden this week. Tokyo is expected to once again demand an investigation into the issue of Japanese abductees. Pyongyang will likely call for eased sanctions in return. Kim min tells us more. Senior officials from North Korea and Japan will sit down for government-level talks on this Monday in Stockholm, following up on the two countries' first talks in more than a year in March. The North Korean delegation will be led by Song Ido, its ambassador for handling relations with Japan, while Junichi Hara, chief of the Asian and Ossetian Affairs Bureau of Japan's Foreign Ministry, will lead the Japanese delegation. A range of issues are expected to be discussed during the three-day meeting, but the Japanese abductee issue will likely top the agenda. Tokyo is again expected to call for a reinvestigation into the whereabouts of Japanese nationals who were allegedly abducted by Pyongyang in the 1970s and 80s. This time, it reportedly plans to get a promise from the North in the form of a document. The Abe administration has a strong determination to solve the abductee issue no matter what, and will consider all methods. North Korea will likely demand Japan to ease sanctions in return. We plan to negotiate on issues regarding how to implement the North Korea-Japan Pyongyang Declaration and also any issues that could follow after the implementation. Attention is also on whether the North Korean delegation will include an official from its state security agency. The agency reportedly played a big role during the visit of then-Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi to Pyongyang in 2002. Likewise, Japan is also expected to slot in a cabinet official that handles North Korean affairs. Kim min Arirang News. Former Japanese Prime Minister Tomiichi Murayama says acknowledging Japan's responsibility for war was not for Korea or China, but actually for Japan. In a special lecture in Tokyo on Sunday, he stressed that the Murayama statement was a unanimous cabinet decision highly valued by the international community, including its Asian neighbors. The Murayama statement, released in 1995, apologized for Japan's atrocities during World War II. As for the current Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's push for collective self-defense through a reinterpretation of Japan's pacifist constitution, Murayama said that uh, if that happens, the constitution will lose its meaning. Korea's number one mobile messenger service provider, Kakao, and the country's number two web portal, Taum, have announced their merger plans. This will be the largest merger involving Internet-based companies here in Korea and could pose a threat to the country's number one search engine, Naver. Kim ji reports. Korea's largest mobile messaging service, Kakao Corporation, has agreed to merge with internet company Town Communications Corporation. When the deal is complete, Kakao will have more than 60 percent of the equity in the merged company dubbed Town Kakao and will be valued up to 3.9 billion U.S. dollars. 
The heads of the two companies expect the deal to create a synergy effect as they compete with the country's largest internet portal, Naver Corporation, and its mobile messaging service line. Taum CEO Choi Seun said Kakao's strong competitiveness in the mobile sector, combined with Taum's contents, will help the company compete in the fast changing market. But some analysts are skeptical that the marriage will help the company enter the global market. Kakao is seeking ways to enter the global market just like Naver did through its line service to survive the competition. With this in mind, Kakao is wasting its time and resources through this merger with Taum, which is a local market-driven company. The unlisted Kakao, which has more than 130 million users, is estimated to be worth $2.3 billion. Town, which is currently listed on the tech-heavy cost stack, is valued at more than $1 billion. Kim ji Arirang News. Korea's finance minister has called on the government and the private sector to work together to speed up the pace of the country's economic recovery. Finance Minister Hyun Woo-suk made the remarks Monday at a meeting with other policymakers, whether, where he also asked businesses to advance investments. He said that while domestic consumption is picking up after the April ferry disaster, stronger momentum is critical. Longer lifespans coupled with a frozen retirement age have Koreans spending less on a day-to-day -day basis than they did 10 years ago, all to make sure that they have enough saved up for the golden years. A survey by the Korea Development Institute shows that the average spending index dropped for all age groups in the 10-year span ending in 2013. But in particular, those reaching retirement age were the most likely to skimp on their daily expenditures as they plan for life post-retirement. The institute says the government should come up with measures to extend the retirement age and also reduce the cost of private education as it takes up a large chunk of household expenditures for families with school-aged children. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world. Join Kang Cheri for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. President Park Geun-hye says reforming public enterprises will be the basis for building a well-founded economy and a starting point to earn public trust. Speaking to the heads of local public entities Monday, the president promised to correct irregularities in the public sector and enhance the quality of their services. In regards to the public sector's heavy debt and lax management, she said their capabilities and efficient management directly affect the country's productivity and global competitiveness. In order to address this, she asked attendees there to make voluntary reforms to root out unfair trade practices, create transparency among public enterprises, increase productivity, and to raise awareness about public safety. Safety. The news last week that President Park Geun-hye accepted the resignations of her presidential security advisor as well as the country's intelligence chief caught a lot of political observers off guard. However, given the ever-present threat posed by North Korea, the president is expected to waste little time in selecting their replacements. Choi yoo tells us more. The question on many people's minds is whether both posts will be filled by those from a military background. Both former security advisor Kim jang soo and former head of the National Intelligence Service Nam Jae-jun came from the military, both having served as the Army Chief of Staff. Despite the view of some pundits that the hardline stances of the military-dominant security chiefs have further strained inter-Korean ties, the speculation is that President Park will tap the military ranks again for her new security advisor. This amid North Korea's continued military and nuclear threat in the region. Defense Minister Kim Kwan jin is one of the names reportedly under consideration. As for the next NIS chief, someone from the diplomatic or judicial community who has experience with the spy agency could be nominated. 
Possible candidates include former spy agency deputy director and current ambassador to Japan, Yi Byung-gi, and former prosecutor and current ambassador to China, Kwon Young-se. Both Yi and Kwon were close aides to the president during the 2007 and 2012 presidential elections. However, the announcement could be delayed as both the ruling and opposition sides have raised concerns. President Buck's recent nominations for key posts centered too much around figures from the judicial community and Korea's southeastern region. With their approval ratings rising after a recent apology over the ferry disaster and the local elections just a little more than a week away, the pending appointments come at a crucial point. There's also speculation that a reshuffle within the presidential office could occur as early as this week. Che Yusan, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye's prime minister nominee An Dae-hee has pledged to give back to society about 1 million U.S. dollars he earned as a lawyer. At a press conference Monday amid controversy over a big jump in his earnings and alleged privilege he gained from his previous post of a Supreme Court justice, the nominee said he was sorry and that he also thinks getting 1 million dollars in a period of one year is too much. He said that he decided to return the money because he he believes his income shouldn't get in the way of fulfilling his promise to set social discipline and eradicate corruption as the next prime minister, adding that he would reform himself first. An's nomination will be confirmed following a parliamentary hearing. With just nine days to go until local elections here in Korea, more and more voters appear to be turning their backs on Korea's two biggest political parties and toward independent candidates. Chi myung reports on the say these voters will have come June 4th. The closer we draw to election day, the more apparent it becomes that voters are leaning toward independent candidates, especially in the city of Busan, a conservative stronghold, and Gwangju, the traditional home ground of liberals. Of all voters on election day, nearly 44 percent are undecided about who they will vote for, according to a survey conducted by Embrain. And of that total, more than half of the respondents said they will vote for independent candidates. This holds extra meaning in the cities of Busan and Gwangju. In the ruling Saenuri Party's home turf of Busan, polls show independent candidate Oh go Don up by nearly four percentage points over the ruling party's Ho byung Su in the race for the mayor. Oh's popularity saw a boost after a candidacy merger on May 16th with Kim Young-chun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy in an effort to unite liberal votes. Over in the race for mayor of Gwangju, right in the middle of the main opposition's home ground, the liberal candidate Yoon Jang-hyun finds himself trailing behind independent candidate Kang eun tae The polls show that Kang's polling numbers are double those of Yoon's. Kang withdrew from the main opposition party to run as an independent in protest of party's co-leader An Chol Su's influence in the nomination of Yoon. According to the National Election Commission on Monday, some 2.4 million more people will be able to vote in these local elections, up 6.3 percent from the last ones in 2010. The increase was attributed to the aging and growth of Korea's overall population. Kim young -gil. Arirang News. Now to the investigation surrounding the April ferry disaster. Authorities are convinced that they are very close to finding the fugitive owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung -un. They've tracked him to the southern region of the country where they believe he's still hiding out. Connie Lee has the details. It was at this rest stop where one of Korea's most wanted men was last seen. Prosecutors have confirmed that Yu byung -un, the de facto owner of the sunken Seoro ferry, was here in the city of Suncheon, about 400 kilometers south of Seoul, up until a few days ago. The married owners of a restaurant and guest house here have been detained on suspicion of helping you evade arrest. Police have also arrested at least three others for hindering the hunt for you. We say all those in custody are members of the Salvation Sect, which is a religious cult led by the ferry owner. With the latest developments, authorities now believe they were very close to finding you. 
They say he's no longer in Suncheon, but they do believe he's still hiding out somewhere in southern Korea because his children and several members of his cult are known to own land and businesses there. In the meantime, prosecutors have dramatically increased the cash reward for anyone with information on Yu's whereabouts. Officials have upped their bounty from 50,000 to 500,000 U.S. dollars, which is the highest amount Korean authorities have ever offered in such a case. The cash reward for information on his eldest son, Yu Dae-gyun, has also gone up from 30,000 to nearly 100,000 dollars. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Twelve years ago, Buddhist temples in Korea began inviting foreigners and visitors in to give them the sense of what it's like to live as a monk or a nun. Today, the Temple Stay program continues to offer a diverse set of meditation and cultural programs, but as our Park Ji-won reports, it's getting a new look to meet the changing needs of society. Since the Temple Stay program was first introduced in 2002, it's become one of Korea's most representative cultural programs, especially for foreign tourists who want a unique experience during their time here. With the popularity of the program rising, the number of people participating in the Temple Stay program has increased about seven times over during the past 12 years. And to meet the new demands of people living in this ever-changing society, the Joge Order, the largest Buddhism sect in Korea, has revamped its temple stay program. A total of 13 pilot temples around the country will launch the new program starting next month. They will focus on tapping into four themes, consolation, health, emptiness, and vision, and are composed of diverse new routines from walking meditation under the moon and music therapy to mountain climbing and yoga, each according to its theme. However, other key routines that have been staples of the Temple Stay program, like Zen meditation, eating the meals a monk might, and tea ceremonies will remain unchanged. Temple Stay program started when Korean hosted the World Cup in 2002. Many people have found comfort and happiness at temples. We are now trying to make the program more systematic based on the four new themes. The Joge Order has also launched a new line of stationary products, inspired by the hundreds of traditional Korean patterns found on temples. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Thailand's monarchy has officially endorsed the country's military to run the country after it staged a coup d'etat last week. With more on this story, we now go to Paul E. standing by for us at the news center. So, Paul, the military is tightening its grip on the country, banning political gatherings and censoring the media. But will this royal blessing have any real impact in bringing peace in this country, or is it just a formality? Well, despite relinquishing much of his powers in the 1930s, the Thai king still holds considerable influence over public opinion, where the monarchy remains the most important institution. However, it's still unclear at this point if in this endorsement will be enough to quell a possible uprising and backlash from protest groups. Thai Army Chief Prayut Chan O Cha announced on Monday that the king appointed him the head of a military council to run the country, which he claims legitimizes last week's military coup. Speaking to reporters in the capital, Bangkok, Prayut said that he intends to hold elections as soon as possible, but gave no time frame for a vote. He also added the army would have no choice but to use force if protests flared up again. We will maintain firm control and deal with those who violate the law or use weapons, as well as any protest or anything that will create a restive situation. Soon after the announcement, the Thai general released 13 anti-government protest leaders who are being indicted with treason and other criminal charges. Scores of politicians, activists and academics have also been taken into custody. The military overthrew the government last Thursday after months of debilitating and at times violent clashes between the populist government of former Prime Minister Yingluck Shinawat and anti-establishment groups.
I see now. Pope Francis has called for the end to what he calls unacceptable Israeli-Palestinian conflict during his uh, trip to the Middle East. Uh, he isn't exactly the one to shy away from controversy in his uh, uh, attempt to bridge the divide between people around the world. So what other unprecedented moves has he been making? Well, during his visit to Palestine, Francis made an unannounced symbolic stop at a wall separating Israel and Palestine, inviting leaders from both sides of the divide to pray at the Vatican. It shows that Pope Francis is doing the annual papal trip his way. Our Connie Kim has more. Pope Francis's first official visit to the Holy Land has been a succession of unprecedented moves calling for peace in Israel and Palestine. Breaking with the custom of only meeting with high-ranking officials in visiting countries, the pontiff instead chose to meet with refugees from Syria and Iraq in Bethany, where Jesus was baptized. There, he called on the international community to support the refugees. I ask that the international society does not turn away from refugees and continue to send support for this issue. In another first, the Pope flew straight from Jordan to Bethlehem by helicopter, bypassing Israel to show Palestine is an independent state. The Pope also made a surprise stop in front of the concrete wall that separates Bethlehem from Jerusalem. For Palestinians, the structure is a symbol of Israeli oppression. Laying his head against the wall, Pope Francis quietly said his prayers. My interpretation of his praying is, let God bless Palestinians and Israelis in order to destroy this wall and to build on this place a reality of peace. In another powerful visual statement, Pope Francis has decided to travel in a white, open-sided Pope mobile instead of a bulletproof automobile. The trip comes after Middle East peace talks broke down last week. The Argentinian pontiff said the breakdown was unacceptable, and in an apparently spontaneous move, he invited the presidents of both sides to the Vatican next month to pray for peace. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And turning now to the elections in Ukraine, exit polls show that the billionaire tycoon Petro Poroshenko is set to become the country's next president. Paul, tell us more about him. Well, Petro Poroshenko made his fortune in the confectionery industry, which earned him the nickname Chocolate King. His business empire also includes several automakers, a shipyard, and even a TV channel. But Poroshenko isn't new to politics. He served in the cabinet of ousted President Viktor Yanukovych and the administration before that. Kiev's election commission said exit polls gave Poroshenko nearly 56 percent of the vote, enough for him to bypass a second runoff with voter turnout at about 60 percent. If confirmed, Poroshenko faces the challenge of pulling the country back from the brink of bankruptcy following six months of political turmoil. The 48-year-old candy magnate claimed victory on Sunday, vowing to bring peace rather to his country and align it with Europe. The first steps which our entire team will take from the start of the presidency will be focused on ending the war, chaos and disorder, and bringing peace to the land for a united and integral Ukraine. The early election results also come as a dozen armed pro-Russian separatists force a shutdown of a major airport in the eastern city of Donetsk. Officials say shots were fired and there was a confrontation. However, there were no reports of any wounded. The group has not made any demands except for the withdrawal of security personnel. Chetty? All right, Paul, thank you very much for that update. As always, I will see you back here in just about two hours. Otherwise, it would have been a perfect day if not for the yellow dust hovering over the country. Now, for more, we are joined by Michelle Park from the Weather Center. Michelle. 
Good evening, and currently, along with the yellow dust, fine dust levels are also three to four times higher than the standard averages. Now, skies are relatively clear, but it may look a little hazy due to the yellow dust in the atmosphere, which will hang around tonight and until uh, midnight for some regions. Now, starting tomorrow, we can expect temperatures to heat up once again, reaching up to 33 degrees, feeling like summer. Now, conditions will be clear and sunny, which also means high UV levels. Now going over to our temperature readings, Seoul will start off the morning at 16 before reaching up to 28 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will peak up to 33 and 26 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 27, Tokdo at 21, while Mount Kungang tops out at 28. Well, that's all I have for you tonight. I'm Michelle Park and back to you, Teddy. Uh, thank you very much for that, Michelle. And that will do it for this Monday edition of Arirang News at 8. Thanks for watching.